Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Javier's Philippine Law Lectures for Students. Today, I'll be discussing the essential concepts of financial rehabilitation as governed by Republic Act No. 10142, otherwise known as the Financial Rehabilitation and Insolvency Act or FRIA for short. Take note that I will not be discussing the procedural rules of rehabilitation in detail in this episode as I will focus on discussing the concepts under the substantive aspects of the law on rehabilitation. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Now, let's begin. Freya defines rehabilitation as the restoration of the debtor to a condition of successful operation and solvency if it is shown that its continuance of operation is economically feasible and its creditors can recover by way of the present value of payments projected in the rehabilitation plan more if the debtor continues as a going concern than if it is li immediately liquidated. Okay? It's very long. The situation here involves a debtor whose assets may not be enough to pay its debts as they may fall due. So one option in this situation is to terminate the existence of the debtor so it can sell off its assets and use the proceeds from that sale to pay its debts. However, this option carries major disadvantages. One of which is that the proceeds from the sale of the debtor's assets may usually not be enough to pay all of its debts in full. And another disadvantage is that once the debtor is dissolved, and its assets are already liquidated and distributed, that's it. There will be nothing left to pay the creditors. Okay? But rehabilitation presents an alternative. Instead of dissolving the debtor and liquidating its assets and paying the creditors with the scraps, the debtor's corporate life and activities are permitted to continue so that the creditors may be paid from the earnings. Now, this continuance of life and business operations is allowed because it is shown that there is a better chance that the creditors will get paid if the debtor's business is restored to successful operation rather than if its existence is terminated and its assets liquidated. Thus, Rehabilitation can only apply if there is a strong possibility that the debtor's business operations can still be restored, that it can be rehabilitated. Okay? So, in case the debtor's insolvency appears to be irreversible or where the sole purpose is to delay or evade the enforcement of the rights of the creditors, then of course, rehabilitation must be denied. Rehabilitation therefore seeks to conserve and administer the assets of an insolvent debtor in the hope that it will eventually return from financial distress to solvency so that it can ultimately pay off its obligations. In the long run, rehabilitation seeks to benefit not only the debtor and its employees but its creditors and the economy in general as well. In this regard, reha rehabilitation has two purposes. Namely, first, to give the insolvent debtor a second chance at life, and second, to allow creditors to be paid their claims from the earnings of the debtor's business. Now, to apply for rehabilitation, it is not necessary that the claims of creditors are due already. What is important is that the debtor is unable to pay its debts as they fall due. Because FRIA does not distinguish between a debtor which is already in debt and a debtor which foresees the possibility of being unable to pay a debt not yet due. Thus, 
whether the debtor is about to be or is already insolvent, a petition for rehabilitation may be filed. And who can file this petition? It will depend on the type of rehabilitation, which may either be voluntary, meaning at the initiative or with the cooperation of the debtor, or it may be involuntary as when it is initiated by the creditor or creditors of the debtor. So in short, either the debtor, the creditor, or both the creditor and the debtor jointly may file a petition for rehabilitation. However, take note that an individual debtor, meaning a natural person that is not a sole proprietorship, cannot file a petition for rehabilitation. In other words, only the following can file a petition for rehabilitation. A partnership through the majority of its partners, a corporation through a majority of directors or trustees with two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock or members, or a sole proprietorship through its proprietor or owner. Now, let's talk a bit about the types of rehabilitation, namely, voluntary and involuntary rehabilitation. So, voluntary rehabilitation, as the name implies, it refers to proceedings that come from the debtor's own initiative, meaning it is the debtor itself that files the petition, or it may be possible that both the debtor and creditor file the petition jointly. In any case, voluntary rehabilitation proceedings may be done either in or out of court. In other words, rehabilitation may be formal in nature as when it is done with court supervision or it may, it may be more informal as when the parties meet, negotiate, and arrive at a mutually beneficial agreement without the assistance or supervision of the court. And these are known as out-of-court or informal restructuring agreements or rehabilitation plans or OCRA, O-C-R-A for short. Again, out-of-court or informal restructuring agreements or rehabilitation plans. Now, OCRAs are agreements or plans entered into and approved by both the debtor and its creditors without court supervision. Here, the parties meet and attempt to settle the debtor's liabilities amicably by agreeing upon a plan for the debtor's rehabilitation and the payment of its debts. Since there are no court proceedings or other requirements to comply with, debtors and creditors may enjoy the advantages of faster processes at less expense, provided of course that both parties negotiate in good faith. Now, while the parties are negotiating and pending the finalization of the OCRA, the debtor and its creditors may agree upon a standstill period, which as the name implies, it preserves the status quo among the debtor and its creditors by suspending the claims against the debtor. Especially since, as stated in the FRIA Rules of Procedure, the standstill agreement may include provisions having the same legal effects as a commencement order under court-supervised rehabilitation, which would include a stay or suspension order, where seizure, sale, set-off, collection, creation of new liens, or otherwise enforcing claims against the debtor are suspended or otherwise prohibited. Okay? So remember, the purpose of this standstill period is to enable the debtor and its creditors to negotiate and ultimately enter into an OCRA. And that is why the enforcement of claims are put on hold by the standstill period. It is to prevent interruption or interference with the negotiation of the OCRA. Now, the standstill period will be effective and enforceable not only against the parties thereto, but also against other creditors, provided that the following conditions are met. First, 
the agreement for standstill period is approved by creditors representing more than 50% of the total liabilities of the debtor. Second, notice of the agreement is published in a newspaper of general circulation in the Philippines once a week for two consecutive weeks and for what purpose? To invite creditors to participate in the negotiation of the OCRA and to notify them that the OCRA will be binding on all creditors once it is finally approved. And third, the standstill period must not exceed 120 days from the date of effectivity. Now, this standstill period will expire under whichever of the following three instances comes first. Either first, upon the lapse of the 120 days I just mentioned. Second, upon the effectivity of the OCRA. Or third, upon the termination of the negotiations for the OCRA as declared by creditors representing more than 50% of the total liabilities of the debtor. So ideally, by the expiration of the standstill period, the parties will have completed negotiations on their OCRA. And to be valid, the OCRA only needs two things, approval and publication. On the first matter, the OCRA must be approved by both the debtor and the creditors holding claims of the debtor in the following percentages. First, approval of at least 67% of creditors holding secured obligations. <clears throat> Second, at least 75% of the unsecured obligations. And third, at least 85% of the total liabilities secured and unsecured of the debtor. So again, approval of the creditors is 67, 75, 85. That's 67 secured, 75 unsecured, and 85 total. Once such approval is secured, notice of the OCRA shall be published once a week for at least three consecutive weeks in a newspaper of general circulation and the OCRA will take effect after 15 days from the last publication. Thereafter, the OCRA and all its provisions, including compromises and rescheduling of payments, shall now be binding upon the debtor and all persons who may be affected, including creditors who may or may not have participated or who even may have opposed the OCRA. And this is known as the cram down effect. You'll uh, hear this later on also in court supervised rehabilitation. Now, after effectivity of the OCRA, in case problems arise, court assistance may be sought, whether for execution or annulment as the case may be, through the filing of the appropriate petition. In fact, in case the parties desire greater assurance that the plan will be performed, they may seek court approval through what is known as a pre-negotiated rehabilitation. And this is the next a form of rehabilitation that we will talk about. This just means <clears throat> that the debtor and its creditors had already negotiated a rehabilitation plan and now they are just asking the court to approve that plan for implementation. As the name suggests, pre-negotiated rehabilitation is a form of voluntary court-supervised rehabilitation which involves proceedings where the debtor and its creditors jointly file a verified petition asking the court to approve a pre-negotiated rehabilitation plan. Okay, they already have a plan. They're just asking the court, court, please approve this so it can be implemented. The verified petition must be endorsed or approved by creditors holding at least two-thirds of the total liabilities of the debtor, including secured creditors holding more than 50% of the total secured claims of the debtor and unsecured creditors holding more than 50% of the total unsecured claims of the debtor. Since the rehabilitation plan has already been previously agreed upon by the debtor and its creditors freely, the proceedings here are relatively faster than the other forms of court-supervised rehabilitation. 
Specifically, while the court will still have to hear objections to the plan if there are any, the court only has a maximum of 120 days from the filing of the petition within which to approve or disapprove the pre-negotiated rehabilitation plan as opposed to the one-year period in other court-supervised rehabilitation proceedings, which we will discuss later. And in case of the failure of the court to act within the 120-day period, the plan will be deemed approved. Okay? And nevertheless, if the court finds that either party had acted in bad faith or if there is an objection to the plan that is not curable, then the court may instead convert the rehabilitation proceedings into proceedings for liquidation. Now, what if the debtor and its creditors had not previously negotiated a rehabilitation plan? Then we can just follow the regular procedure for court-supervised rehabilitation, which may either be voluntary or involuntary. And uh, voluntary rehabilitation is easy enough to understand. No? This is just initiated by the insolvent debtor by himself by filing a verified petition for the court. So it's either by the sole proprietor, by majority of the partners, or by the directors together with the OCS or the trustees together with the two-thirds of the members. Okay. Now, involuntary rehabilitation on the other hand this is initiated by the filing of a verif verified petition by any creditor or group of creditors with a claim or aggregate claim of either at least 1 million pesos or at least 25% of the subscribed capital stock or partner's contributions of the debtor, whichever is higher, showing either of the following grounds. Okay, only two grounds. First, there is no genuine issue of fact or law on the claims of the petitioners and that either the due and demandable payments thereon have not been made for at least 60 days or the debtor has failed generally to meet its liabilities as they fall due or second ground, at least one creditor other than the petitioners has initiated foreclosure proceedings against the debtor which will prevent the debtor from paying its debts as they become due or will render it insolvent. So, in these cases where court supervision is sought, the party filing the petition must establish the insolvency of the debtor and the viability of its rehabilitation. Some of the important attachments to the petition include a schedule of debts and liabilities listing all the creditors and their respective claims, an inventory of assets of the debtor, including accounts receivables and claims against third parties, summary of disputed claims, affidavit of general financial condition, and of course, the most important, the rehabilitation plan. On the first matter, it must not only be shown that the debtor is insolvent, but also that its rehabilitation is actually viable. And how do we show this? The Supreme Court has given some examples. Like, first, the business fortunes of the debtor have actually improved since the petition was filed. Or the general circumstances and forecast for the operating sector of the debtor shows a likelihood that its business will revive. Third, the debtor has taken concrete steps to improve its operating efficiency. Or fourth, the majority of the secured and unsecured creditors have expressly manifested a preference that the debtor be rehabilitated rather than liquidated and they are willing to compromise on their claims to achieve that result. And other similar uh, factors. No? In any case, a successful rehabilitation will usually depend on two factors. Namely, a positive change in the business fortunes of the debtor and the willingness of the creditors and shareholders to arrive at a compromise agreement on repayment of burdens, extent of the illusion of credit, and other matters. For a deeper discussion on this uh, topic, you may read the 2012 case of San Jose Timber versus SEC GR number 162196. 
So, how exactly is the viability of the debtor's rehabilitation shown? And how will such rehabilitation be done? That is why a rehabilitation plan is a necessary requirement to all forms of rehabilitation. A rehabilitation plan is defined as a plan by which the financial well-being and viability of an insolvent debtor can be restored using various means. Now, these means may include but are not limited to debt forgiveness, debt rescheduling, reorganization, debt to equity conversion, the sale of the whole or parts of the business, or even the setting up of new business entities and other similar arrangements which may be approved by the court or by the creditors. And to be considered as economically feasible, the rehabilitation plan must have the following characteristics. First, the debtor has assets that can generate more cash if used in its daily operations than if it is sold. Second, liquidity issues can be addressed by a practicable business plan that will generate enough cash to sustain daily operations and the debtor has a definite source of financing for the proper and full implementation of a rehabilitation plan that is anchored on realistic assumptions and goals. And for a deeper discussion on this uh, matter, you may read the 2017 case of Land Bank versus Fastec, GR number 206150, and the 2018 case of Metrobank versus Fortuna, GR number 190800. Now, I won't go into detail anymore about the procedural matters on the rest of the proceedings, but I'll just give a brief overview. So, the petition having already been filed, the court will now uh, look into the sufficiency in form or substance. And if it finds the petition to be sufficient in form and substance, then the court will now issue a commencement order declaring the debtor to be under rehabilitation, stating the grounds relied upon and the relief sought, and appointing a rehabilitation receiver among other directives which you may read in administrative matter number 12-12-11-SC or the financial rehabilitation rules of procedure. You can also find the rules on the qualifications, powers, removal, etc. of receivers there, which I will not be discussing here for lack of material time. Okay. However, one thing to note is that in the commencement order, this shall include a stay or suspension order, which in short, suspends the enforcement of all claims against the debtor and prohibits the debtor from paying liability, liabilities outstanding as of the time of the commencement order and also prohibiting the debtor from disposing of its properties except in the ordinary course of business. So, all claims against the debtor, whether secured or unsecured, judicial or extrajudicial, these are all suspended, even including the collection of deficiency taxes. In fact, one of the effects of the commencement order is to exempt the debtor from liability for taxes and fees including penalties, interests, and charges for both national and local government. However, there are certain exceptions to the stay or suspension order which you may read in section 10 of AM 121211SC, okay? the Rules of Procedure. But some exceptions, I'll give some, no, are uh, cases on appeal before the Supreme Court or a specialized court or in case of enforcement of claims against sureties or other persons solidarily liable with the debtor. Why? Because that person is not the one who is insolvent. So you can go after that surety. That surety, after having, made to pay, have, after having been made to pay, what's his remedy? He can now go after the debtor. Okay? Remember why? Because he bound himself solidarily. Okay? You review your obligor. So, by suspending claims and ensuring that the debtor does not pay any other outstanding claims, the rights of all the creditors are protected to the end that no one creditor gains an advantage over another. 
This way, the principle of equality is equity is maintained and all creditors stand on equal footing. Take note that the preferred status of secured creditors is still retained and respected. It is only the enforcement of the preference that is suspended. Okay? Moreover, the stay order does not have the effect of amending or modifying existing contracts. Okay? Now, take note also that suspension of claims is necessary so that the management committee or the receiver, as the case may be, can now be substituted for the debtor in any pending action against the debtor. And also so that the, risk, the rehabilitation receiver can effectively exercise his powers without being interfered with. Meaning that the receiver won't be wasting time, effort, and resources in defending the debtor in cases to enforce claims. Instead, the receiver can now focus on rescuing the debtor through rehabilitation. However, the fact that the claims are suspended and that the debtor is prohibited from paying its liabilities does not necessarily mean that it is also prohibited from incurring obligations after the commencement of rehabilitation proceedings. Okay? The debtor may still incur credit arrangements and other obligations essential for rehabilitation if it is recommended by the receiver and approved by the court. Okay? Such expenses, if incurred, will be considered as administrative expenses. Now, what if after commencement of the proceedings, there are claims that are paid, set off, or enforced, or even liens that are created on the property of the debtor? This is after commencement. Okay? Then, the commencement order will now serve as the basis to annul all of those and render them null and void. Okay, why? Because bawal nga. It's prohibited. Okay? In fact, the effects of the commencement order, including the stay order, shall retroact to the date when the petition was filed, thus rendering void any attempt to collect, enforce, or set off any debt against the debtor after the commencement date. Okay? So, after the court issues the commencement order, rehabilitation proceedings will begin including the filing of respective notices of claims by creditors who are not listed in the schedule of debts and liabilities in the petition. Next, we also have the filing and the hearing of objections, if there are any, and the submission of the report of the receiver recommending rehabilitation or the dismissal of the petition. Okay? But in the meantime, while the proceedings are ongoing, who manages the affairs of the debtor? Well, as a general rule, whoever is managing the debtor, the affairs of the debtor, will generally continue to serve unless they are causing actual or imminent dissipation, danger of loss, wastage or destruction of assets, or paralyzation of business operations, or they are guilty of gross mismanagement, fraud, or gross or willful violation of the FRIA, or other wrongful conduct. In which case, the court may appoint either the receiver or a management committee to manage, to take over the management affairs of the debtor in order to ensure the preservation of the debtor's assets. Now, after the proceedings, the court may either grant or dismiss the petition. Or the court may even convert these proceedings into liquidation proceedings. Now, let's uh, talk about dismissal first. The petition will be dismissed if it is found either that the debtor is not insolvent. Why? If it's, it can't file the petition if it's not insolvent, no? Second, if the petition is a sham intended to delay the enforcement of liabilities. Third, the petition, rehabilitation plan, or its attachments contain any materially false or misleading statements. And fourth, the debtor has committed acts of misrepresentation or in fraud of creditors. So in either of those or combination of those, the petition for rehabilitation will be dismissed. Now the court may also convert the proceedings to liquidation, which may be done if it is found that the debtor is insolvent, that uh, there is no substantial likelihood that the debtor can be successfully rehabilitated, and that there has been 
a failure of rehabilitation rather or no it, uh, if there has been a failure of rehabilitation so again uh, the proceedings may be converted into liquidation if it is found that uh, there is no substantial likelihood that the debtor can be successfully rehabilitated or there has been a failure of rehabilitation otherwise if the court finds that the debtor is indeed insolvent and that there is a substantial likelihood that it can be successfully rehabilitated then the court will grant the petition and direct the receiver to confer with the debtor and the creditors to review or revise the rehabilitation plan as the need may arise no in either case if reviewed or revised or uh, retained the rehabilitation plan will then be submitted to the court not more than 90 days from the order granting the petition and if there are any objections of course they will be heard now if the objections are denied or they are cured by the parties or if there are no objections to the plan then the court will now issue an order confirming the rehabilitation plan the court may also confirm the plan despite unresolved disputes if the plan has provisions no, or rules for paying such claims. The court may also approve or implement the plan even if the debtor has not approved it if the terms of the plan are necessary to restore the financial well-being and viability of the debtor. In any case, the court shall have a maximum period of one year from the filing of the petition to confirm the rehabilitation plan. And if not confirmed within that one year period, any interested party, the receiver, or even the court itself on its own initiative may convert the proceedings into liquidation. However, if the plan is confirmed, then it shall have the following effects. First, the rehabilitation plan and its provisions will now be binding on the debtor and all persons who may be affected by it, including the creditors, whether or not they have participated or opposed the plan, and whether or not their claims have been scheduled. And again, this is known as the cram down effect. Okay, I mentioned this earlier. Next effect, the debtor will now have to comply with the provisions of the plan and take all actions necessary to carry it out. Third effect, payments will now be made to the creditors in accordance with the provisions of the plan. Fourth, contracts and other arrangements between the debtors and its creditors shall be interpreted as continuing to apply to the extent that they do not conflict with the plan. Fifth, any compromises on amounts or rescheduling of timing of payments will now be binding on the creditors whether or not the plan is successfully implemented and fifth and six claims arising after the approval of the plan that are otherwise not treated by the plan are not subject to any suspension order so thereafter the receiver will then uh, submit a report and accounting and if approved by the court the receiver will then be discharged if there is a need to amend the plan, it may be done by appropriate motion to be filed with the court and heard by the court. And in any case, once the plan has been confirmed, it will then be implemented and the proceedings terminated. So that's it for financial rehabilitation of insolvent debtors. Just remember that in rehabilitation, the purpose is to allow the debtor to continue its business so that the debtors can get paid from its earnings or from operations instead of dissolving and liquidating the debtor where the proceeds may not be enough to pay the creditors. Rehabilitation may be informal as where the parties arrive at a successful negotiation or it may be formal with court supervision. In any case, to avail of rehabilitation, it must be established that the debtor is insolvent and that there is a substantial likelihood that it can be successfully rehabilitated as shown by an economically feasible rehabilitation plan. So I hope you may have learned a thing or two and I hope to see you next time guys. See you soon. Bye.